just a few miles of sea separate Western province of Papua New Guinea from the Australian Torres Straits Islands. The waters between the two countries boast diverse marine ecosystems, mangroves, seagrasses, and coral reefs. As well as sharing the sea and its resources, people on both sides of the border have centuries of common culture, traditions, and long-standing family bonds. With this in mind, the Torres Straits Treaty between the two countries was established in 1985 to protect traditional customs, conserve the environment, and promote sustainable development. It's the Papua New Guinean side that's the focus of a CSIRO project characterizing traditional small-scale fisheries. Funded by NFA and AFMA, the PNG and Australian Fisheries Management Authorities, the project collected data and information to assess the impacts of fisheries on marine resources shared between the two countries and to understand the importance that these fisheries have for the livelihoods of local communities. To have a, a real assessment of the status of marine resources in the region, we had to have a clear picture of what was happening in the two sides of the treaty area. The Torres Strait and the PNG side of the, uh, the treaty area um, have very different socio-economic conditions. While uh, Torres Strait can enjoy a Western uh, lifestyle, on the PNG side, people fish for their survival. To, uh, to allow to eat every day and to have a dedication for the main needs of the families. Western provinces are, are very dependent on fishing. Um, this is one of the main reasons to that is uh, the province, especially in South Fly, South Fly has very limited uh, agricultural land as the place is always inundated and you also have a lot of uh, estuaries and uh, uh, waterways. A lot of people depend on fishing for daily sustenance and also you know, for economic purposes uh, to make money for school fees, uh, special occasions. Fishing activities disrupted, it affects a big part of their life. In the last few decades, the move from a traditional to a cash economy has had a profound impact on the way people fish. Previously they were using traditional methods for their consumption only, but now with the uh, the high demand or the need to buy food and all this, they go into new nets and all the new technology that increase the volume of fish that is coming in and resulted also with the reduction in the uh, first stock and all this and along the coast there. Modern technology has coincided with a strong global demand for marine products, including high value products such as fish bladder, shark fin and sea cucumber. Mark Bizet is a village leader in Bula, a remote community close to the border with Indonesian West Papua. The only way the people in my community make money is through fish products and dried fish products that we sell to Indonesian buyers who come over. Well, the Indonesians are only interested in the fish bladder, the Brahmani bladder, the chew fish bladder and the Sark fins. Well, the rest of the fish is when it's still fresh, the, we can, the community takes it for their supper. And if they are already bad, then it is thrown away. While there's been a sharp rise in demand for marine resources, there's also been a significant growth in the number of people making a living from the sea. For years, toxic sediment from the Octedi mine in the highlands of Western Province has swept down the Fly River, impacting villages on its banks. That, combined with a severe lack of services and infrastructure in those remote areas, has driven thousands of people to settle in Daru, the coastal hub. Okay, our people left because of the pollution experiences and the damages caused to our waters, our garden crops, they migrated to Daru around uh, uh, 90s. Okay, these people, their livelihood is in the sea. They everyday fishermen, they go out to the main reef which we share, catch fish, come down here and sell for their daily earnings and the survival of their children. And then there had been a bit of uh, disputes 
because of them migrating here and staying here, and even using the Great Reef, which the reef doesn't belong to the, the people of La Riva. But what, what uh, should our people do? Yeah, we have those uh, new settlers who came to Daru from the uh, outback villages. They're also fishing in the same traditional fishing ground. So the traditional owners just kind of control. Uh, everyone is fishing together. Yes. While population pressures are having an impact, climate change is also making its mark. Sea level rise is evident on the low-lying coastline. The village was right out, about 100 metres out. And then just because of the situation now we're facing, uh, especially with uh, waves and wind, that's why we were driven back. So we may be looking for a relocation, because I don't think that it's going to, going to be stopped. We are being, still being driven back. Illegal fishing is also on the rise. Uh, you have a lot of uh, illegal fishing going on, especially current, uh, with the closure of the beach steamer. Currently we have a moratorium closure. This closure, although it's in place for the past two years, this hasn't been uh, um, really effective in the province because of the current illegal activities that's still ongoing. The effect of these myriad pressures on fisheries is reflected in a decline in the abundance and size of marine products. There have there has been a big, big reduction in the space, size, especially size of uh, the fish that has been brought to the market. We are coming to a problem that we are running out of fish. You know, fish has to be left to grow to nature. But there's no time for nurturing, and fishing every day. Yes. Given the very real pressures on fisheries, the involvement of communities and stakeholders was a priority for the project. One of the first steps was that of capacity building and having local people involved in the field work and in the collection process. And to make people understand the importance that projects like this have to understand how to better manage the fisheries, which can sustain people's livelihoods today, but also in the future. Another priority of the project was that of being able to put in touch communities with management authorities, so to create a continuous dialogue in between the two parts. This project has been uh, very successful. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, positive feedbacks and uh, from a lot of the communities, uh, they really appreciate us going around. It is a really good thing that we can always come back, come down to the community level and really understand what's happening in the community and the fishery. CSIRO and NFA are now looking at how to provide communities with the necessary scientific skills and knowledge to manage and sustain their marine resources in this fast-changing world. We want the resource owners to continue to use their fishery resource, but we do not want to see depleted in a short time or in the years to come. We want something that's sustainable, that's continuously useful, and that continues to sustain the lives of people who depend heavily on it.